This is Volume, Sirius XM 106. Debatable, where Mark and Alan talk with your favorite musicians. I write songs because it's cheaper than therapy. On Volume, Channel 106. Tell me, tell me where do we stop? Everything is falling apart. Same shit that kept us apart. I've been gone too long. Welcome back as we enter the final hour of today's installment of the Debatable program. Mark Goodman is out today, so joining me, I have the thrill of welcoming DJ Hesteprin back to the show yet again. Yet again. Always the best. And, uh, and as promised, Tegan Quinn joining us on a big week of news for Tegan and Sarah, big things happening the new single, Yellow, is out. The announcement of the new album, Cry Baby, coming in October. New tour dates, all kinds of things happening. Tegan, welcome. Good to see you. And uh, uh, Thank you. Lots, lots going on. So I'll, I'll start things, and then, I, like I said, i got to back out of this and just let you guys go. But <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't even know where to begin around this sort of, you know, flurry of activity in Tegan and Sarah world because we've got the TV series and we've got the new album and we've got the tour and we've got a new, a new baby in the mix. Like all of these things are happening. What's, how are you, how are you navigating through getting all this, everything up, up and running here? You know, honestly, Sarah and I have been doing this for such a long time. We st started making music in the nineties when we were teenagers and we managed to figure out how to graduate high school. Um, smoke a lot of pot, drop acid regularly, and be in a band. So I feel like, you know, we can handle having a TV show and a graphic novel and an album. You know what I mean? <laughs> this is... And a tour. And a tour. Yeah. Uh, so it, it feels, it does not feel uh, as overwhelming as it should, which tells me either something's terribly wrong with us or we're just killing it here and we're just managing it all and we have a great team. But ultimately we just have... Um, an amazing kind of team around us and we're just really excited this is our 10th studio album and the tv show we made is so queer and so awesome and it's just i don't know i just wake up every morning and i'm like just do it you're so lucky hurry before they take it away from you <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, I'm go ahead go ahead i'm obsessed with the song yep. i'm obsessed with the video the song is yellow there's an homage to it's like an, is there like an homage to Coldplay in this and, and yeah the, you I know mean, has well, we're, and yellow also yeah, well, Coldplay, I have, you know, that small band Coldplay that hardly anyone's ever heard of. They have a pretty, you know, random deep cut called Yellow. Um, so when Sarah <laughs> and I were brainstorming ideas for a music video, Sarah was like, maybe this is just like way too on the nose. But what if we did an homage to Coldplay's Yellow and we just remake their video, which is this really beautiful, very classic video where Chris Martin's just walking up the you know, British coastline in the rain in a rain jacket. And so we remade it in Vancouver a few weeks ago at dawn in the rain. Really hard, you guys. Seems like a simple concept. Not easy to sing a song at chipmunk speed. That's how you get that slow motion effect. It was really hard. I love that. I watched it three Still. times today. I love the hook. What is it? That bru The bruise is not black, it's yellow? Yeah, this bruise ain't black, it's yellow. I Can know. That, please. For the fans out there, what do you want me to do? You want me to sing it? Um, no, you, well, you could sing it, sure, but I want you to oh, like no. talk about it. What does it mean? Oh, it means <laughs> the profound, the profound, uh, the profound statement. Yeah, I thought. I mean, I can't take credit for the genius of it. I mean, um, you know, I think Sarah is a really, really visual, beautiful, po almost like a poet. The way that she writes lyrics, and when she sent this song, I mean, it's an earworm. Like it definitely felt uh, catchy to me. But there's just something about that line is so beautiful. I mean, Sarah's writing about. A lot of different things with the song sort of about the early part of our career and our relationship as siblings and this idea that you know we've been doing this for a really long time and a lot of the wounds of being young people and and kind of tortured and torturing each other as young people that those bruises are starting to heal you know um and we're sort of moving past we spent a lot of be totally transparent we spent a lot of last year in therapy sarah mm -hmm. and i together navigating what will happen next with our career you know we've just been doing such a long time and sometimes we're like why are we do we want to still do this as it turns out we do <laughs> so i think a cry cry baby like our 10 studio album is definitely a a lot of it is about that sort of conversation that we are having which is you know about what to do with our lives which often feels very shared you know mm -hmm. i gather as that. you know <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I gather that the 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 writing process was a different one this go round. And what's the is the what's the is there a relation between the therapy and that uh, you know the sort of creative ex extension of that? Yeah, I think so. I mean. I sort of, in the first year of the pandemic, Sarah and I were doing this Instagram live show and I started talking about how I was writing all these songs and Sarah wasn't giving me any feedback. And so live on the internet to like 20,000 people, Sarah admitted that she doesn't trust my opinion and she doesn't think I should trust hers either. And that so many years into our career, we just might not know what's good anymore. And that really, I think that really actually kicked off the real writing of the record because I think that's when we opened up our circle a bit. We started to ask for feedback. And I also think we started to give each other a lot more feedback. I mean, ultimately I was like, I would, I do trust Sarah. And I, she had written this song yellow. She'd also written a song called I can't grow up and another song called I will all I wanted. And, you know, they were in my opinion, really beautiful, very deep songs. The production was really, really thought out and developed and the architecture of the record felt like it was starting to come together. And it felt, valuable to me to have Sarah guide me so that my songs didn't feel like I was building a condominium next to her like beautiful regal I don't know mid-century home or something so we just yeah we started to collaborate in a way we never have um and I sort of let Sarah come in and she called it renovating but she like came in and renovated my songs so that they felt like they would fit in in, in the world she was building and and somehow we came up with Cry. <laughs> and what to you, for you, what did you see emerge out of that? I mean, what's what what results that are different well, than where you'd been? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think sometimes those kinds of results or that kind of vision or understanding of of what we've made comes once the public has heard it. Like, I, which I hate to say, like not to say that other people's opinion informs mine, but until it's fully constructed and released, it's hard to say. But I I think the biggest thing was that at this point in our career, we've sort of made a vow not to just put things out, just to put things out. You know, we have a really amazing relationship with our audience. I feel like we have a lot of trust that we've built over the last two decades with our audience. And it's really important to Sarah and I that we put out music that feels really meaningful, but also takes risks. And I feel like because of that conversation, because of that conflict, and because of the work that we did with each other, we became a lot more collaborative and that made us a better record, I think. <laughs> I guess we'll find out what other people think, but um, yeah, I just think it just, it reshaped the way that we were making the record because it was clear we needed to do something different, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you and you have the book, High School. Mm -hmm. the book's being made into a show, or is now gonna be a show. Mm -hmm. It's a graphic novel. Mm -hmm. Where, how do they feed into each other? Is the book, is the graphic novel the graphic novel of the book? What's the <laughs> Well, so, yeah, so Sarah and I wrote a memoir in 2019 um, called High School, which was about our time in the 90s in high school. It's our origin story as a band, but we also, I think the book is really a coming of age story, of course, you know, it's everyone's sort of important time in, in high school. Um, but it's also when we figured out we were gay and and although we didn't come out in high school we came out immediately following high school so the book um did really well which was exciting and thrilling for sarah and i and then we partnered with our friend who's a writer and director um and actor uh clea duvall and the three of us went out right at the beginning of covid basically and pitched the crap out of the book and um and amazon uh said yes to making it we are partnered with uh, this company called Plan B, which is Brad Pitt's production company. And the show, we just made it over the winter um, and spring, and it is almost locked and it comes out in the middle of October. It'll come out on Freebie, which is a channel on um, Amazon. Um, and I, I have no idea, I have no perspective. I've lost the plot. I think it's really good. <laughs> I think it's really sweet as a queer person, as a woman, as a musician who never sees myself reflected, like we almost never see women making music. We only see men and men celebrated for the process of becoming artists. It's really cool because the show delves into, you know, this fictional Tegan and Sarah, but it's, it's very much based and inspired on our fire story, but learning to play music, learning to communicate with each other, figuring out their sexuality. It's set in the nineties in Calgary. It's like the soundtrack is all nineties music. Um, and you hear these first pieces of music that we wrote in the 90s. And uh, and the stars of the show are identical twins from Fresno, California that Sarah and I found on TikTok. Never acted, never played music. 
literally I can't think of anyone more brilliant to have done it and they just absolutely killed it it was so brave and amazing and I just think um yeah I hope people like it if they don't it was still such a cool surreal experience and ah, I don't know (laughs) what was I mean what was you guys sort of hands-on involved like what was that were you just there to consult to say hey here's what we would do in this situation or like what was it for you to enter that universe yeah it was a lot of things i mean we were part of um you know developing and taking the show out to sell it and we're executive producers and co-creators of the show so we definitely did a lot of you know the initial early days sort of um selling and you know that kind of world clea uh, wrote and directed six of eight episodes. And then the other writer on the show is this amazing, brilliant woman, Laura Kittrell, who came to us from a show called um, Insecure. And she's also brilliant. And um, so we were like heavily involved in giving notes. Laura and Cleo were very patient. I'm sure they probably had, what are those dolls called? Like they were like probably like sitting, throwing you know? <laughs> Yeah. And like probably like had us up on a dartboard in the writer's room. We gave ridiculous amounts of notes. But you know, these people were writing about that they're going to be writing about they're still alive for the most part so we're you know we're really protective it's our ip it's our story um if people like the show they'll think of tegan and sarah if they hate the show they'll think of tegan and sarah so you know we were like definitely like handling it uh but we couldn't have picked a more brilliant team and wonderful collaborators so uh once we were into production sarah and i were mostly just there as uh, tourists um you know sitting in our director's chair or in our uh our executive producer you know chairs um watching the screen and and uh just feeling completely like pinching ourselves and being like, remember in the nineties, we just take acid. No one would have thought we made a TV show about it. What? <laughs> you know, so. Did you guys get to meet Brad Pitt? And I'm asking that because people will want to know. I know. Of course they will. Everyone asks. We haven't met him yet. If the show does well, I assume we would. Yeah, that's when you get the call. <laughs> Plaus- yeah. Plausible deniability. That's. Yeah. <laughs> so I, it's the most, you know, it is the most boring thing to ask and to talk about, but all of this stuff, everything that you're generating here, all of this is, has been through pandemic, has been through lockdown. Um, Canada has appropriately taken this seriously throughout. Um, you know, what has it been um, each step of these? Some just collaborative in terms of you guys and then other things, l- different layers of collaboration and everything else just getting through all of this and being able to do it and you know did this this time that we are all struggling through find its mm-hmm. way into this work it's a great question i mean some of the work we were going to do prior to the pandemic anyway like the graphic novel that julie brought up we actually sold that at the same time as our memoir and it's it's a completely fictionalized story about tegan and sarah but it's uh set in current times and it's you know, um, it's for kids eight to 15, that range. And it's, it's purely fictional and it's an amazing collaboration with this wonderful artist, Tilly Walden. Um, and that's out next spring that was already on the docket. So the pandemic, we were like, Oh, great. Well, I guess we'll stay home and write that graphic novel that we're supposed to write. Um, we actually wrote two, it's a series. So, you know, some of the projects were already happening and, and we just used our time off during during the pandemic off the road um, to work on them. Some of them were, I think, definitely byproducts of being home so long. Like I think the record itself, like Crybaby is, you know, I think a reflection of what happens when you're 20 years into your career and you have three years off the road to consider like what happens next? What are we enjoying doing? Like we sort of took stock of our lives. Uh, You know, we had one record left with our label Warner who are amazing partners. We were with them 15 years and we went to them and said, please let us, we gave them an acoustic album we made of, of an old album of ours and asked if we could just give them that and, and leave the label and go back to the indie world. And, you know, I think some of those kinds of decisions we made are a product of us having time off for the first time in our adult life and saying, what do we want? And I've been signed since I was 19 years old. I don't own my music because I got signed and I've basically been in the same record deal my entire adult life. And I felt pretty passionately that we should own our like we should we should have a different kind of record deal we should be back on an indie and we should have ownership and have a bigger say in in what we're doing and so yeah i think in different ways what happened during the pandemic and that sort of existential questioning definitely made its way into some of our art but a lot of it was the bullet train of tegan and sarah never sort of ceases so you know it was sort of already happening and how do you feel about going out? Like, I mean, I we we people <laughs> toured together extensively yeah. back in the day. 
I, yeah. I mean, you, you guys are, are twin sisters, okay? Not just bandmates with boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries, you know, there's no, there's no boundaries. Now you've been separate, you've been home, you've been working on several projects. They're all successful, amazing, but you're going back to be Tegan and Sarah on the road. <laughs> How do you feel? Well, it's funny you put it that way, like going back to being Tegan and Sarah. It is a bit like putting on a costume and a mask in a way. I think the, the costume and the mask is very much Tegan and Sarah, but it's the public version of Tegan and Sarah. And when you've had so much time off out of the public eye, because I don't count social media as being in the public eye, you know, or releasing things, it's weird. Like, I feel terrified in a way. I mean, for some really obvious reasons, like what would it be like to tour during COVID, you know, obviously I see it in my Twitter feed every day, like bands canceling and, you know, there's no protection for that. If we go out on the road and do three weeks of dates and a week of those dates get canceled, we have to eat the cost of that. We have to pay our band, our crew, tour buses, insurance, gear rental. Like it's, it's wild, you know, all the merch that you don't set. Like, it's just, you know, we're running a business and I, the, the business of touring is definitely one we're really good at, but I don't know what it would be like to do it during COVID. So terrified, but then also like, you know, excited uh, at the challenge. I think, you know, Sarah and I are identical twins and we've been in a band since we were teenagers. And sometimes it feels like um, we're continuing in our adolescence by being in a band. Yeah. And I can tell myself I'm an, a professional. I own multiple businesses. I got books. I got graphic novels. I got a TV show. What do you need? But there's something about the band that feels really teenage and adolescent. <laughs> like where I'm like, oh, I'm in a band. Like, you know, like... Oh, I'm gonna go to tour bus. I'm gonna go to catering now and, and have, <laughs> yeah, like, is there a vegan option? <laughs> yeah, it just feels childish when yeah. you think of like climate change and abortion rights and like you know there's like these huge conversations and then you're like anyway I gotta get ready for my VIP event with my fans like I don't know I just feel like a cartoon character but I also just know how important music is and I know how important it is to bring people together and to kind of transcend all our differences and, and sing to people and have them sing back at you and how special that can be. And I just feel like whatever the risks are, it's worth it and it's time to do it. Yeah. What, what's it going to look like? Like who do you have? I don't know if you've announced it yet, but who's like, what's the band going to be? What's uh, we're putting, we're, we're putting it. To, yeah. We're putting it together right now. I mean, the show is a, a hodgepodge of music from the last 20 years, plus a bunch of the new stuff, but it's definitely, um for people coming out it's going to be really fun we're definitely playing the hits we're going to bring back where does the good grow and like some of these big hits that we just like never play because yeah. we're like yeah watch Grey's anatomy and you can get it but yeah we're bringing back all the classic tegan and sarah stuff um there's a fan online who asked how many retweets they would need to have us play everything is awesome from the lego movie and i was like uh 500 and they're getting close so i have a feeling we might need to learn that um <laughs> but yeah we're just like you know it's gonna be a big bombastic bombastic fun tegan and zara show you know we haven't been full band for five years so it feels really exciting we're um we just hired the band this week they're awesome we're putting together some great production um tom berlin is coming out to open and you know like for the most part i think the like room in new york is pretty or the space in new york is pretty big but the rest of the tour is you know really modest sized room so it's really intimate and i don't know just go out and connect and have fun i gather if i'm if i'm remembering right that you sort of went into like start to start to demo start to feel out these songs and suddenly surprised yourself by making a record uh, yeah, <laughs> that it's uh, that it it presented itself. Um, you were working, I should say, with John Congleton, amazing producer who's worked yeah. with you know a, a long list of folks. Just did the Regina Spector album, and so you know so many more. But um, yeah. you know, was do you think what does that say either about these songs or about where you guys were at that you turned around and suddenly just knocked a record out? Well, it's funny. You're exactly right. We had a handful of songs we felt really confident about, and we we um, had switched management after like 18 years, and and um, our sort of interim management had this I thought really brilliant idea of just kind of creating little worlds around one song at a time, and kind of just going and I believe what he called it was playing in the you know streaming sandbox, which is kind of barfy, but also like sure, like that's what people are doing these days. Why not? Um, and yeah, we tapped John Congleton, who Sarah knew from our time living in LA. They had socialized together and we just, I think John is brilliant. The new Regina record is amazing, but he's done like, you know, most of St. Vincent's albums and just like a lot of great stuff, just did the Death Cab for Cutie record. And um, 
we were like, oh, let's meet in Seattle and work on a couple songs. We hadn't left the country. We hadn't left Canada in, in almost two years. And uh, we were like, let's meet in Seattle and, and work on a few songs. And like day one, I hadn't laughed that hard, you know, in a couple of years. And the music just sounded amazing. And John had brought in this incredible um, musician to sort of accompany, like just play everything. Like we were using a lot of programming, a lot of Sarah's production, but um and just, I don't know, just spent the entire day laughing and, and having fun. And I remember I called our managers and I said, I, I, let's hold more time with John. He keeps joking that we should make an album. Let's find more time. And so then they called me the next day and they said, well, John's manager wants to know if you're making the album. If you're making the album, you know, we can clear the schedule. And I'm like, well, tell him. He needs to show us he can clear his schedule. Like, you know, we came this sort of like, but we're like in the studio hanging out and laughing. But then I'm out in the parking lot being like, and then you tell his person. Um and then, yeah, I don't know. It was just weird. I think our, our, our managers at the time were like, what are you guys doing? Like, you don't need to make a record. But as soon as we were there, I don't know. Maybe it's just, I can't explain it. Just It just happened. It was like a spark. It felt like a story. The songs felt like a story. I mean, sometimes it just takes sitting down with a third party and explaining what the songs are about. And you just start to think like, oh, well, there's these other songs that are, you know, just, I don't know, it just happened. It was like dominoes. And we went home from that session and I wrote pretty much my, my side of the record. Like I wrote a song called Smoking Weed Alone. And I wrote a song called, can you swear? Can you say mm -hmm. the F word on here? Okay. <laughs> I wrote a song called Fucking Up What Matters. And another song called Whatever That Was and sent them to Sarah. And, you know, she was renovating them. And we sent them to John and booked more time. And then before we knew it, we were finishing an album. I like how it's like, John made you laugh. You're like, he makes me laugh. <laughs> like, you want to marry him? And you're like, he makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounded really cool too. I mean, you know, we've been in the pop world now for 10 years, which is great. I loved it. I mean, you know, uh, never say never that we would go back, but you know, I think we write pop songs, but we were definitely missing like sort of the more organic fun, just get out there and play DIY vibes, you know? Yeah. It, and uh, um, yeah, there was just something about being in the studio and, and watching everyone jam and play and build these like very, I mean, the first song we worked on was um, I can't grow up. And it's just a monster. It's a monster. And and John just kept turning around and being like, oh my God, I can't imagine. Like, it's going to be so big when you go play this live. And we did this other song called Pretty Shitty Time. And like, it, you know, I just was sitting there thinking, oh my God, like I can see us playing. And that's like so big, right? Like, it's just like being like an athlete. Like when you start to picture yourself playing shows, when you start to picture what the audience looks like and what they're going to do when you're playing, it's like you start to sort of really mentally wrap your mind around like holy shit we're making an album it's like yeah. we got to do this it becomes like a compulsion you know like we're like we have to this must be heard people need this music <laughs> did you think that you were going to stop like did you think in your heart of hearts you were going to stop is that what drove what what drove you into therapy was it that well sarah and i've been in therapy a few times over the course of our career and we always sort of use it as like sort of like um how do we communicate like it's almost like we're you know in couples counseling it's like we sh music is our child and we're divorced yeah. and we have to figure out how to run our children's lives or something, you know, like in music, music is that children. By the and way, so it feels like to be on tour with you. If anyone, if anyone <laughs> wants to know what it was like to be on tour with Keegan and Sarah, that's what it is. It's like being on tour with like two divorced parents. Yeah. But like they get along. Yeah. yeah. They share this. Like, it's like my parents, my parents went to high school together and, and they've been friends ever since they got divorced when we were four, but they always say like th their bond is that they made us like, you know, like their marriage didn't work, but they have this thing and they love us and we like vacation together. That's Sarah, that's Tegan and Sarah basically. And, um, so I think we just, we felt like it was time for a top up. Um, I felt like we were pr like, we were, we were pretty disconnected and I think like leaving our label 14 years, leaving our managers of 18 years, I think from outside people were like, what the hell are they okay? Right, but it yeah. was like we needed to, it was time like it was time to renovate it was time to change things up it was time to sort of you know we'd been working in tv and books for a few years and it was kind of like okay we got to go back to music but how do we how do we make all these things work together mm -hmm. you know and how do we make them so they don't cannibalize each other and that just kind of meant a different kind of management strategy and a different kind of strategy in general and so we my mom actually who's a therapist suggested this woman who works with companies who often are family businesses and and um, she just had this really interesting skill set. She was kind of like HR, but a therapist, but also very familiar with the dynamic of family business. And she just came in and she was tough. You know, when we would get super emotional, a lot of it was like, I'm not a referee. 
like grow up. Like she must've told me to grow up like a thousand times. Like at one point she turned to Sarah. Sarah couldn't understand why I couldn't understand her. She was so emotional. And the therapist turned to me at one point and was like, Tegan, make your eyes soft. And then she turned to Sarah and she said, now Sarah, see, like, you know, like she's soft, like forgive her. And then Sarah was like, I just don't understand. Like, how can she not feel this way? And then she, <laughs> without missing a beat, my therapist goes, Sarah, Tegan's just not that deep. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, but also maybe, maybe not. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Right. So it just was like, we just kind of, I don't know, this person just came in at the right time. Like, who knows if other therapy times in our lives that would have worked for me. But there was something about this woman just, you know, because I always complain. I'm like, I'm like the optimist. And I'm like, let's just try it. And let's just do it. And Sarah's always like poking holes. And she's such a bummer. And again, the therapist was like, oh, Tegan, grow up. Not everybody loves their job. God. And I was just like, you know what? Fine. You're right. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> So I don't know. We've kind of come up with this compromise. The one brilliant thing, not there was other things, but one thing that she said that was really amazing is identical twins. We feel so desperate to be seen as individuals and we're grouped together so often. And then on top of that, of course, we have a business that's based on us that's together. And so and when we started therapy, she was like, I get it. Let's try to see and define your life and set up your business. So you're, you're individuals. And after about six sessions with us, she was like, I was wrong. You can't do that. That'd be like, Starbucks having two presidents and, and each president has their own vision for the company. It doesn't work. You're a business. This is a brand. You signed up for this. Let's figure out how you can work together and you, you, you compromise and stop using everybody in your life as a referee. And I was like, oh shit. Okay. Well, damn. That sounds pretty spot on to me. She's pretty good. We keep recommending her to other bands. She also helped us create like a literal job description for a music manager and then help to interview prospective managers, like with a traditional HR process, like we created documents about how to communicate and boundaries. And like, I've been in the business 20 plus years. I've never done that. Our business has not have any of that. Yeah. And now every band I know that's going through stuff, I'm like, you should talk to this woman. She's amazing. Cause we need to treat her. These are businesses. This is yeah. our art. Like, yeah. but it's also business is how we pay our bills. It's how we work. I go on tour with 16 right. people and they are my coworkers. Like we should have boundaries. We should have rules. We should have mutual respect and understanding and just hadn't occurred to me well it had but to the therapist that's an answer to kind of what i was going to ask which is it sounds like you were able to sort of not turn on a dime but immediately take this take some of this you know straight into practice yeah i mean i feel like we were at a point where it was either we just do it without a lot of like without a lot of um pushback or we break break up the band like and um because I think like in our regular life, like I think as sisters and family, we really love each other and get along. And, and, and it was like, if, if it's really this much torture to understand each other and have empathy and put up with one another, then what on earth are we doing this for? And so I think once we heard a lot of what she had to say to us, this therapist, it was sort of like, all right, well, I'm not going to try to be right. Right doesn't matter. Like it was kind of like, I, you know, we write obviously mostly write music about love, love and relationships. And I have this really good friend who had said that, told me this thing years ago about how like in a relationship, I, I thought relationships were about compromise. And she was like, well, compromise is two people both not getting what they want. That's not the success. Like that's not success in a relationship. A success in a relationship is taking turns. So you do something for your partner because you love them and you want them to have that thing because they love that thing and you love them. And then they do the same for you. It's not compromise. And I just, I talked about it for years and then we got into therapy and I brought that up and Again, like Sarah and the therapist were both like, that's all this is, is compromise. That is what being in a band is, is compromise. It's not taking turns. So Sarah and I's entire life is compromise. And that's exhausting. And we can either be exhausted by it, or we can accept it, lean into it, get, you know, be really good at it. And like, I think we just decided last year, we have too many good things happening and we have too much still to say and too much still to do that we just need to accept that our life is about compromise and that we're going to be, we're not individuals, <laughs> just like psycho. But <laughs> Tegan, we're going to have to let you go in a second. I have to read this tweet from uh, our friend Brad Alden who wrote, I've been listening to Tegan and Sarah since the public radio station in Minneapolis started playing the album. So jealous. I am 66 <laughs> now far from their typical fan goes to show good music can break through to anyone. Best of luck on the new album and tour. So, uh, that's awesome. You'd be surprised. 
But big surprise on how wide the range of people who listen to Tegan there and the type of person. But that's so awesome. Thank you so much for sticking with us. And, it means and, a lot. <laughs> and, bef- and before I let you out of here, without you know violating confidentiality rules and all of that, but give me give me one good DJ has to print story. <laughs> oh my! <gosh. laughs> well, I actually feel like. Uh, DJ has to print is pretty well behaved. Um, I our, our days on the road together. I feel like maybe her bandmates might have been up to compared to those two. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like you were well behaved because you were in a relationship. Um, you know, but uh, I got nothing. I got nothing. I, you just have always been such a badass friend. You're so talented. It's a joy to be able to speak to you in a different world and see how much you've been doing in the last decade and you see your career expanding and flourishing and like, you know, we just need more women like you in the industry. It's just, I'm so yeah. proud to have you as a friend. Stop, go on. I agree. And I want to say one more thing, <laughs> about and ladies, which is so much of the under, like the, the subtext of a lot of everything we talked about on this mm-hmm. show is yeah. also that Tegan and Sarah as the band have been in this business since they were basically kids and the bit and they've maintained relevance for two, 20 years, right? Something like 20, 22 years, something like that. Yeah. The business has changed dramatically in yeah. every way. And the two of you have been able to sort of ride the waves of the change of technology and the change of mm-hmm. so many different things and continue and opened up sort of new income streams for yourself, new ways to service your fans that feel real and relevant and authentic and not corny. And I mm-hmm. do think that there is so much to learn from what you guys have done. And I hope that it's, if you're not already working on it, I hope that at some point you have some kind of an offering for young artists Mm. master class or a, a something like that because you've yeah done- yeah thank you for saying that look i mean we're certainly we've had offers over the years to like are you ready to talk about the early part of your career are you ready to talk about this are you ready to give guidance i mean we're definitely getting close you know i just actually just proofread a, a, a book that was written about us um that's coming out um gosh in like a month um it's called modern heartthrobs um this wonderful woman who interviewed us all off and on all through the pandemic and wrote this book that's like it's hard it was hard to read like a real extensive look at our career and how we were treated and the sexism and misogyny and homophobia and all the rest of it but sort of shining through that was that like we keep figuring it out we keep adapting like you say we ride the wave we're open to change we're open to evolution i mean ultimately i think sarah and i's superpower is that we're just we're willing to just keep, we're willing to just keep evolving. You know, we're not stubborn and stuck in our ways. Uh, to me, it's a gift to get to do what we do. And if that means I have to go on TikTok, then I will go on TikTok. If it means, you know, like, it's just, I, I don't know. We just want to always be great. Like this tour coming up, like the record we're putting out, it's just, we just put everything we have into it. We take risks and we make it fun and interesting. And you, you know, you can stick with us for our whole career or jump in tomorrow, but what you're going to see is the same Tegan and Sarah as when we were teenagers. And it's just like, we have that vibrancy and that passion to just do what we love. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Take a deep breath. The new single yellow is out. The cry baby <laughs> album is coming in October. Watch for the TV yes. series, high school for the graphic novels coming. Didn't even mention the sub stack that you just launched, but there's that. Yeah. So yeah, please check out our sub stack. I think we're alone now, Tegan and Sarah sub stack. I mean, someone just called it a magazine the other day, but we love it. It's my favorite spot. Down with social media, up with sub stack. Up with sub stack. <laughs> Tegan and Sarah coming at you from all directions. Tegan Quinn, thank you so much. A pleasure. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, we are going to take a break. We're going to pause and we will come back and uh, wind things up on Debatable in just a minute. That's me and DJ Hester Pren. Stick around. Treat you like a credit card, I can't- 